Dear friends, dear colleagues, dear foreign and Russian guests, it's a special day we're having today at Tangimo University because we have a very special guest, uh, Lina Espersen, Foreign Minister, Minister of Denmark. Uh, she is, uh, I guess, the Fed lady in one and a half year we have a chance to receive in this university because uh, more than half of our students are female now. I think it's maybe of special interest not only to listen uh, to the minister, but to attack minister with questions relating not only to the present state of relations between our nations, but also to the way they build career in the West, so that you could compare with the way you can build career here in our country. So, uh, Mrs. Espersen uh, made a great career in her country because she first uh, was, became a leader of a conservative party, one of the two major parties in her country, and she uh, had chance to become minister several times in several governments, and her most recent appointment was to lead the Danish foreign policy, Danish diplomacy. So I, I don't know uh, what uh, uh, themes she specifically is going to cover in her presentation. We only know that uh, we expect her to talk about 20 to 25 minutes and then we open the floor and because uh, you might have microphones inside the audience so you can uh, address her with questions you like. So, because we have not so much time, I would prefer to invite uh, Mrs. Peterson uh, to, to talk from the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much, distinguished first vice rector, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor and pleasure for me to be given the opportunity to be here today at the distinguished Moscow State University of International Relations. Likewise, I am honored to be asked to speak about a topic that is of such great importance to the Kingdom of Denmark. And the topic that I've chosen uh, is the Arctic, because this is something where both Russia and Denmark has got a lot at stake. The Arctic region is undergoing profound change primarily because of global warming. The consequences of global warming are felt all over the planet, but nowhere, nowhere more so than in the Arctic region. Recent scientific studies tell us that global warming is proceeding twice as fast in the region compared to elsewhere. And in the last five years alone, the region has witnessed the highest average temperatures since measurement began in 1840. The scientific models predict that temperatures will continue to rise in the years to come. Consequently, the ice is melting much faster than we originally anticipated a few years ago. This inescapable fact of nature will change the way of life in many different ways, locally in the Arctic as well as globally. So we face new challenges. New challenges in understanding what is happening as a consequence of global warming to the environment in the Arctic. How it affects the living conditions of the Arctic peoples. And on that basis, how we should respond and also adapt to these changes. The good news is, however, that we also face new opportunities new opportunities by way of better access to oil and gas exploitation, by way of easier extraction of minerals and rare earth, earth elements, as well as possibilities of new shipping routes, like the Northeast Passage, north of Russia, as the ice melts and retracts. Ladies and gentlemen, one of my key messages that I would like to convey to you here today is that Denmark, Russia, and the other Arctic states are faced with challenges in the Arctic region that none of us is capable of handling alone. If we are to achieve sustainable solutions with a lasting impact in this region, we need international cooperation 
and it is absolutely essential. There is simply no alternative to international cooperation if we want to reap the benefits and seize the opportunities that await us in the Arctic. And this brings me to the ongoing cooperation that we actually have between Denmark and Russia with regard to the Arctic. First of all, it takes place at the international level, for instance, in the International Maritime Organization and the United Nations Environmental Program. But we also cooperate at the regional level, including in the Arctic Council among the five Nordic countries, Russia, the US, and Canada, as well as in the framework of the five Arctic coastal states, that is Denmark, Russia, Norway, Canada, and the US. Finally, we cooperate on the bilateral level as well, for instance, on scientific expeditions in the Arctic Ocean. And let me use this opportunity here today to focus on our regional cooperation in the Arctic Council, which is the preeminent forum for discussions among the Arctic states and peoples. From April 2009 until May this year, the Kingdom of Denmark, which consists of Denmark, Greenland, and the Faroe Islands, was chairing the Council. When we assumed the chairmanship, the Arctic Council was a quite unique, though in some respects also a strange forum for international cooperation. The members of the Council were not only the eight Arctic states, but also the organizations of the Arctic indigenous peoples. It had no common budget and only a temporary secretariat made up of three persons. The council, council was not a decision maker, it was only a decision shaper, in the sense that it paved the way for decisions at the local, national, and international level. Furthermore, it had not been able to solve the so-called observance question the question of whether or not to grant observer status to countries outside the Arctic region that wanted to become observers of the Arctic Council. At the seventh ministerial meeting of the Council, which took place in May in New Greenland this year, and which concluded the Danish chairmanship, we agreed on establishing a permanent secretariat with a common budget to be financed by all member states. We also adopted criteria for observer status and agreed on their role in the Council. In addition, we found a way to proceed on the question of whom to grant observer status. And lastly, but certainly not least, and for the first time in the history of the Arctic Council, we adopted a legally binding agreement on search and rescue in the Arctic. For the first time ever, the Council was not only decision shaping, but actually also decision making. The fact that the Arctic states managed to get an agreement in only a short span of time was to a large extent thanks to the excellent work of the two chairs of the task force, that was Russia and the United States. Let me use this occasion to express my gratitude and also to thank the Russian government for the tremendous effort it put into getting this agreement adopted. It was certainly no pushover and it required a lot of diplomatic footwork and delicate maneuvering, skills that Foreign Minister Lavrov and the Russian delegation took to new heights. So thank you. The NUC ministerial was, has been called the most important and most productive ministerial meeting since the establishment of the Arctic Council. It has also been called a smashing success of Danish diplom diplomacy, not by ourselves, but by the partners in the Council. But we would not have succeeded had it not been for the excellent cooperation between all the participants in the Council. Now, however, we need to implement what was agreed in NUC and further strengthen the Arctic Council. We are looking forward to join forces with Russia and our other partners towards this aim. Furthermore, we think that the Arctic Council should cooperate with all relevant countries and organizations that are interested in the region and are able to contribute. To be more concrete, Denmark thinks that the Arctic Council should admit observers to the, uh, as, and, the, and the present applicants should be admitted to be observers. And these applicants are China, the Republic of Korea, Japan, Italy, the European Union. The simple reason being that they can contribute a lot to the work of the Council. 
A further strengthening of the Council is also a key element of the Arctic strategy for the Kingdom of Denmark, which I, represented, uh, which I presented in Copenhagen two weeks ago, together with the Premier of Greenland and the Prime Minister of the Faroe Government. The comprehensive strategy with some well-defined goals and some clearly established instruments to get there was necessary if Denmark is to play a more proactive and prominent role in shaping the developments of the Arctic region. Let me give you just a few highlights of the strategy. It has four main goals. Firstly, a peaceful, secure, and safe Arctic. Secondly, sustained economic growth and development. Thirdly, protection of the vulnerable Arctic climate and environment. And fourthly, close cooperation with our international partners. In this prestigious place of learning and scientific inquiry, the Moscow State University of International Relations, I find it particularly appropriate to focus on this last point, the international aspects of our strategy. Peace, stability, and cooperation are what characterize the Arctic today, and that is, of course, the way it must remain. In contrast to the impression that one often gets from the media, the Arctic region is not a, a one big, unregulated, white spot on the planet where anything goes and where the principle of first come, first served applies. This misunderstanding has even led some to propose an Arctic treaty similar to the Antarctic treaty. But they miss one fundamental thing. The Arctic is an inhabited part of the land and sea areas of the Arctic states. And the Arctic is regulated by the national laws of the Arctic states and by international law. In 2005, the five, in, sorry, in 2008, the five coastal states in the Arctic Ocean adopted the so-called Ilulisat Declaration at a meeting conveyed by Denmark and Greenland. The declaration clearly states that the question of the Arctic region in a changing climate must be dealt with peacefully and by the way of negotiation within the existing international framework including the United Nations Convention on the, law, on the Law of the Sea. Last year, Russia and Norway reached an agreement on the demarcation of the Barents Sea after having discussed this for 30 to 40 years before you were born. Well done, and congratulations that we finished that. We very much welcome this agreement. It is proof that the Ilulisat Declaration works and that the agreement serves as a model for solving any overlapping claims of the continental shelf in the future. It has been estimated that 97% of the oil and gas resources in the Arctic are to be found inside the exclusive economic zones of these states. Consequently, the resources have already now been allocated. Any potential controversy that might conceivably erupt in the future about the region's resources will therefore only concern the remaining 3%. This is not to say that everything is an eternal bliss among the Arctic states, but it reduces the potential scope for disagreements about the region's oil and gas reserves. Gradually, step by step, the countries involved in the Arctic are building an even more solid and even more elaborate framework of cooperation, one that I believe will enable the responsible governments to handle the challenges of security in a credible and also very peaceful fashion. Then two words about our bilateral cooperation on the Arctic with traditional and new partners. This is also a very important uh, priority of our strategy. The strategy emphasizes our wish to further expand and to develop the cooperation with Russia. For example, on strengthening the safety in the Arctic waters and on scientific research, including on the continental shelf. It could also include, as it says in the strategy, the exchange of findings on economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable development, as well as confidence building and studies on potential cooperation between the Danish and Russia defense, particularly in the maritime area. In short, we see a great potential for Arctic cooperation between Denmark and Russia. Finally, let me, let me tell you that I really, truly hope that uh, the Arctic is one of the places where we can have 
a much stronger uh, cooperation. And uh, I was so lucky yesterday to be able to have a bilateral meeting with Foreign Minister Lavrov. And I can tell you that we, uh, we said goodbye to each other, promising each other that we will continue co to cooperate on Arctic matters because it's of huge interest to both the Kingdom of Denmark and to Russia. Thank you very much. So now the floor is open. You can ask questions. Who's ready? You're also welcome to ask questions not related to the Arctic. If you want to know something about Danish politics, the European Union, NATO, Libya, Syria, uh, be my guest. Uh, these are the topics that I usually discuss most of the day, so please, please be my guest to ask any, any question. But maybe I can tell you that Two guys almost half the members of the Danish government are, are women. <laughs> Uh, good day. Uh, I will again uh, uh, steal uh, two personal. Uh, first of all, uh, what do you think Libya? We have to make it there. No, we have to make it in the last side of the Islamic radical or democrat. And the other personal. We have to go to Denmark and the Eurozone. Uh, jeg vil oversætte spørgene til engelsk. Uh, jeg uh, I asked uh, the foreign minister uh, her opinion uh, about Libya. Uh, who uh, will get the power there? Uh, Islamic radicals or Democrats? And uh, the second question, uh, when uh, will Denmark get into the Eurozone? Thank you. Good yes, thank you. Two very good questions, and I'm extremely impressed by a Danish. <laughs> uh, the first question about Libya. As you know, Denmark has uh, been one of the extremely active states uh, trying to uphold uh, the UN Security Council Resolution 1973 on a no-fly zone plus, uh, putting our F-16 fighters uh, uh, in Libya, uh, bombing uh, the Gaddafi military installations. Uh, and uh, we have believed very much that we think that the people of Libya deserve a democracy just as uh, in the rest of the world. Um, I went to Benghazi uh, and met with the Transitional National Council in the end of June together with a delegation from the Danish parliament. Actually, almost all the parties in the Danish parliament were represented uh, when we went to Benghazi. And it is my clear belief that the roadmap uh, that the Transitional National Council has made for Libya will uh, be an inclusive process where all the different tribes in Libya will be part of the Transitional Council and they will prepare for a new, uh, well actually, they will prepare for a constitution. There is no constitution in Libya at the moment. They will prepare for parliamentary elections. Uh, political parties were illegal under Gaddafi. They will now be allowed. And I actually think that you will see a pluralistic society in the future. There will be both conservatives, socialists, extremists, um, youth groups, all kinds of different groups there. Uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, our, uh, our task will be to help them build up a democracy, a civil society, uh, supporting human rights, uh, free media, rule of law, but we should not dictate, the, dictate them who's going to decide in Libya. This is for the Libyan people themselves to do. And uh, we are very careful, the international society, I've been a member of the Libya contact group since it was started uh, in, uh, in London in March. We're very careful that we are not the ones sitting you know, in the driving seat. It should be the Libyan people who are in the driving seat uh, in, the, in the prospect for it. But I'm, I'm quite convinced that it will end up, it will be a bumpy road, but we will end up in a good way uh, for the future. I really believe in that. Um, with respect uh, to your other question about Denmark uh, becoming a member of the Euro, my party is very pro-European and we're very much pro-becoming a member uh, of the Euro 
just as we want to get rid of the other three opt-outs that Denmark have on, on the European Union. I just have to be honest and say, with, with the current state uh, of the Eurozone, especially some of the southern European countries, it will be very, very difficult for us to convince the Danish people who will have to say yes at a referendum to do it right now. The Danish economy is much stronger than the Eurozone. Um, so it will not be right now that we do it, but uh, I'm hoping very much that after our election, uh, we have a parliamentary election next Thursday. So you're very lucky that I'm here and not in my constituency. Uh, after, after this election, I'm hoping very much that the new government will take a leadership in convincing the Danish public that we need to get rid of the opt-outs. But the euro right now is very difficult because of the debt crisis in southern Europe. Uh, but we believe that we can overcome it and hopefully make the eurozone strong again. Uh, Europe needs that. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My question is going to concern the Arctic region. Yes. So we all know that there are only straight uh, baselines uh, along the Norway Arctic region. And uh, along the Canadian Arctic coast, there are also only straight uh, baselines. But the United States of America is the persistent objector of uh, straight baselines. So what about Denmark's position in this question? And are there any straight baselines in, in, along, along the uh, Arctic coast of Greenland? Thank you. I'm not sure I understand what, what straight baseline is. Um, but, uh, but, but I would say that what, what has been our position is that we believe that the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea is what regulates uh, the whole way that we are drawing the borders between the Arctic states. We have the problem that the United States has not yet ratified the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And we're hoping very much that uh, Congress will start working on that soon. I was so lucky that when uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, together with Foreign Minister Labro, was with me in Nuuk in May, there were also a member of Congress who will now try and see if we can get the Americans on board so that we are regulating this in the same manner, all of us. Uh, I don't know if that was your question, but at least I would say this is our position. And uh, we believe very much we are both cooperating with the Canada. Where are we going to make the lines between the Kingdom of Denmark and Canada? And we're cooperating, as I said, with Russia. We know that one of your scientists put a flag underneath the North Pole. But we might going to claim the North Pole anyway. <laughs> but we are right now actually cooperating with each other on the, on the scientific work so that we agree on the scientific data. And then we will sit together and try and see if we can make the baseline. So I think we should do it according to international law, and I think we should do it in a peaceful manner. Thank you. My name is Eric, and I'm from Sweden, from your neighbor country. And I have a question regarding um, pro-action. You talk about there being a, uh, an agreement that came regarding search and rescue. Mm -hmm. However, if you look to studies that have been done, for example, by Frederick Glasser in Canada, the shipping industry is not very interested in the Northeast Passage or the, um, the Western Route uh, along Canada coast. So where is the pro-action? Where pro-action is actually present in those areas where it's not so pressing still. If we look to oil exploitation, for example, how long uh, will it be before we will actually see developments in that area? I think you're absolutely right, Eric, that things are not progressing very fast. But I also think that we have to understand that development in the Arctic re region has to be done in a very sustainable manner. One of the problems facing the Arctic area is safety. Uh, we know that, and we can see that, that the cruise ships that sail up along the coast of Greenland, they can go further and further up, and they can go into fjords that they've never been able to go into. And everyone thinks this is fantastic because it's like being an explorer, that you go to places where no human has ever been before. The problem is that no one has measured how deep it is underneath the water. So the risk of actually having a real catastrophe is quite big. 
This is the reason why we've said, well, we don't mind having commercial shipping, uh, more cruise ships in this area, but you need to have more focus on safety. So we are right now measuring um, the, the, the waters underneath Greenland. And we're also working in the International Maritime Organization, usually called IMO. We're working on a polar code because we believe that commercial vessels who want to sail in the Arctic region or who even want to use the Northwest Passage, they need to live up to stronger standards than shipping in the rest of the world. For example, we want um, the captains on board to have knowledge of the Arctic region so they are not people used to sailing in the Caribbean because you have to know what you're doing if you're sailing near icebergs. Uh, this is just one example. And another example is that we are right now exploring whether we should make it a demand that if pr cruise ships want to sail in the Arctic region, they have to sail two and two together as pairs because if one ship goes down, even though Denmark, Russia, Canada, the US, Norway, we have fantastic cooperation. If there are a thousand tourists suddenly lay, lying in the water, they will die very, very fast if there's no one to, to pick them up. So we're looking in different ways of trying to make safety even better. And I would say we are supporting very much the indigenous peoples of Greenland in their need to have more business uh, opportunities. There will be both Chinese investors and others coming to, uh, to Greenland, looking for minerals um, and, and so forth. And this is great, but of course it has to be done in a matter where the indigenous peoples are taking into account. So uh, you're right that things are not moving very fast, but I also think that it's good that we, we have that we are very thoughtful about the way that we're doing things so that it's made in a sustainable manner. And I know that the government of Greenland has been especially keen on making sure that oil drilling is done by the high standards. Uh, we don't want to see uh, a repetition of what happened in the Gulf of Mexico. So we are very, very, very keen on if there's gonna be more uh, drilling for oil and gas, that it's the highest environmental standards. And uh, we know that Greenpeace and some of the other NGOs are actually against having even any activity in the Arctic region. I think that the indigenous peoples of the Arctic should be allowed to use the resources, but it has to be done in a sustainable manner. So I think if we continue in that course, we will save the environment, but we will also make business opportunities. Ms. Esperson, good afternoon. Uh, could you be so kind to say if the law of the European Union is applicable in Greenland and in the inclusive economic zone of Denmark extending to the north of Greenland? Thank you. Greenland is not a member of the European Union. So uh, Greenland is outside uh, the European Union. Of course, this, this causes me to sometimes um, have two different hats on because according to the Danish constitution, uh, I am leading the foreign policy of the whole kingdom of Denmark, including Greenland and the Faroe Islands. But they're not part of the European Union, where I'm also sitting as foreign minister. So sometimes I have to negotiate, negotiate with myself, uh, <laughs> which is a little bit difficult. For example, with regard to fishing quotas, uh, which is something that is of extremely high interest of both the Faroe Islands and Greenland because the, one of the main income is from catching fish, shellfish, etc. They will have to negotiate with the European Union swaps of quotas in, in different seas. And uh, Denmark is helping out uh, on this. So we have actually, we are helping Greenland and Faroe Islands in their context to the European Union with ourselves part of the European Union, but they are not. So it is a little bit difficult, but I would say we have an excellent uh, relationship and, uh, and until now, knock on wood, there's not been any problems in changing hats once in a while. What do you Good afternoon, Mr. Vil jeg gerne sige tusind tak for, at du har kommet, og for den spændende foretrag. Og nu vil jeg switch til engelsk for at svare på min spørgsmål. Og det er om de parlamentarie valgene, som du har nævnt. 
And could you please point out the main differences of the two coalitions, the red block and the blue block, in the uh, approach toward the foreign policy in general and uh, to Danish-Russian relationship uh, in particular? Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, very impressive Danish. Uh, I would say that um, I think that the main difference between the red and the blue bloc in the, in the, in the, at the parliamentary election is on uh, economic uh, policy, where my government has said that we don't want Denmark to have a high debt. We have seen what has happened in, in Greece and many other places. So we've put forward an austerity program for the next three years and uh, reforms of the Danish pension system uh, the labor market, making it even more flexible. All of this to make sure that when we reach 2020, the Danish economy will be in balance uh, and we will be able to afford, you know, we have a welfare state where almost everything is free for all citizens. We want to continue to have it this way. So we've done that, whereas uh, the Red Bloc uh, is choosing the way of uh, President Obama, where he's, they're saying, well, we want growth. We don't worry so much about the debt, we want growth now, so they're going to spend much more money uh, and not go through this austerity program. And we think that's very dangerous because we could end up with an even higher debt uh, and we will be, I think, punished for that by the financial markets being able, and then being pushed to, pu to pay high interest rates, etc. So we disagree on that. With regard to foreign policy, um, I have been able to have uh, broad majorities behind all uh, big foreign policy issues. Uh, our mission in Afghanistan uh, is supported by a broad majority in the Danish parliament. When we sent the F-16 fighters to Libya 24 hours after the Security Council uh, made resolution 1973, it was actually with all parties in the parliament, all, all parties. Then one uh, of the small uh, left-wing parties uh, stopped after one week to support it, but the rest are still supporting the Libya mission. Um, the Red Bloc uh, two days ago presented a foreign policy paper, which when you read it, is not that different from what I'm doing right now. But they have in the press said that they want a completely different policy if they win uh, power. I don't believe so, but uh, I don't think there will be any change in the relationship with Russia. I think that uh, all Danish politicians realize that Denmark has to start trading much more with the BRIC countries, with Brazil, with Russia, India, China. We cannot only trade with the European Union where the growth rates are too low. So I think no matter who's foreign minister after the election, we will still work on having a much, much stronger relationship with Russia and especially strengthen the trade relations much more. Um, with regard to other issues, um, you might experience small changes, but I think overall, uh, I expect any government to still have broad majorities behind the decisions being made. I personally believe that if you're sending Danish soldiers to war, you should do your utmost to have almost all the parliament behind you. Uh, I think the soldiers deserve that. So, uh, and I think this is a position that most uh, agree upon. Так, я все жду, может, на том краю, но нет никого, пожалуйста, тогда вы. Thank you very much. Mrs. Esperson, on behalf of all the students of our university, let me thank you for visiting GIMO and for your very informative lecture. And could you please answer the following question? The recent tragedy in Norway has definitely influenced the whole world community and the EU, the EU particularly. Uh, there was a shooting incident in front of the mosque in Copenhagen, mm. and, uh, which has also revealed some problematic issues um, <coughs> in the relations, in the attitude towards the immigrant. Mm. Uh, what do you think? Should there be any improvements in the immigration policy be taken in order to prevent uh, such acts of violence happening? And uh, my second question, which is not intertwined with the first one, 
uh, is what the defining what are the defining traits that a woman should possess to 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 achieve such a success in politics as you have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, the first, regarding the, the tragedy in Norway, it's something that has affected many Danes to a high extent because we believe that Norway is, is like a, a brother to us uh, or a sister. We were very closely related to our uh, Scandinavian, the other Scandinavian countries. Uh, so we've been mourning with Norway. I think the, this guy in Norway, he's just an extremist crazy guy and I think of course it is worrying that a person that has been brought up in a middle class home in Norway not lacking anything can end up being so sick in his brains as, as this guy was. Um, I think that the Norwegian government even though that they're a social labor party and I'm a conservative party I actually think that the Norwegian government has done a tremendous good job in trying to make the Norwegian people stand together not full of anger and hate, but full of tolerance uh, and, and, and with, the, with the message of we stand united and uh, we will not be pushed into more extremism. So um, from a Danish point of view, of course, our security forces are used to be Minister for Justice and Interior for seven years. So we know that there are extremist groups, groups on both the left wing and the right wing, but our police is looking very carefully uh, into them to make sure that they're being stopped if they're planning something. I think that what we should do is, um, of course, to, 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 uh, to in our policies show that we have tolerance. Uh, in Denmark, we have uh, religious freedom, so in this, there's room for everyone. What we have tried to do in the Danish government is to make sure that people that come to Denmark actually get a job because it is a problem if you just sit in an apartment and get welfare and it's not part of the Danish society. And we are quite successful in that. So more immigrants now are working, getting an education, and I think this is actually what will create an even better society uh, for the future. So, um, and of course we are having shooting incidents, actually also at this moment in Denmark. I think most of the shooting incidents are related to gangs um, fighting uh, about a drug, uh, drug trade in Denmark. Uh, so I think the shooting incidents has not something to do with religious or other extremist things. It's about money uh, and different groups. Uh, there are some uh, groups called Hells Angels Banditas, which are like gangs uh, on motorcycles. And then there are immigrant groups, and they're fighting each other who will be in charge of uh, illegal weapon sales and illegal drug sales in Denmark. And uh, while well, they're shooting on each other and the police are, are trying to, um, to get things in control and they're doing that quite successfully, I would say most of these people are in prison and they will stay there for a very long time. Um, regarding the other question about what makes a, a woman successful, I think the same as a man. Um, uh, I think what uh, you need is, of course, uh, a strong uh, political belief. Uh, you need to be very, very good at details uh, in certain areas. When I became a member of parliament 16 years ago, uh, I'm from the north of Denmark, from the fishing and farming area of Denmark. I became a speaker on these areas, and I tried to become just as smart as the minister of uh, fishing and aquaculture in order to ask him very difficult questions. And uh, I think that um, if you want to become a good politician, you have to show that you are, you know your detail. You cannot only say, you know, nice remarks, blah, blah, blah. That is not going to convince everyone. You have to show that you are very smart. If you're able to do that, and you're able to also be very persistent and say, I want this, I'm going to do this, then you have a real chance of, of succeeding. And, uh, and I would say that in, in, in Denmark, um, we have a lot of women in the Danish parliament, about one third. As I said to you, half, almost half the government uh, are women. And actually most of the uh, party chairmen are also women. I used to be the party chairman of the conservative party. I'm not anymore, now it's a man, very nice man. But uh, my kids, uh, I have two kids that's eight and nine years old, two boys. They once told me, listen mom, why can't a man be a party leader? 
<laughs> because they were so used to seeing all these women on, on, on TV. So um, I would say that it's just uh, go for it, uh, believe in it, and don't take any bullshit. When uh, some of these older men uh, try to say things about the way you look or you're a woman, just tell them to shut up. That's what I'm doing. Uh, I want to be treated as a person uh, and not like a, a vulnerable woman. Uh, I'm a politician and I've done a lot in order to get where I am now, so I want to be treated exactly the same way as a man. Ms. Asperson, good afternoon. Thank you for your speech. It, it was really interesting. And my question is about economic uh, cooperation. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that uh, uh, business establishment in your country is extremely interested in Russian market. Uh, and uh, is uh, the market in your country uh, so open as in Russia? And uh, what can you offer for Russian investors? Thank you. Well, we are a very open, as a member of the WTO, um, we are very open and very pro-free trade. Uh, it is absolutely no secret that Denmark uh, would like for the whole world to have even more free trade, remove subsidies and remove obstacles uh, for trade, because we, we firmly believe that it will benefit uh, people uh, all across the globe if we do that. Um, our business community is very interested in getting uh, even more trade with Russia, both Russian investments in Denmark and Danish investments in Russia. And one of the new initiatives that we've taken in the government is actually this spring, we have appointed uh, five new ambassadors, which will only be focusing on export. There's a, a woman uh, ambassador uh, for Russia, export ambassador called Mayan fischer -Bohl. She used to be uh, the Commissioner for Agriculture in the European Union, and she's going to do her best in order to make more Danish companies try their forces on the Russian uh, market. One of the areas where I really believe that we can make a difference is on uh, the green tech area. As you know, or as you might know, in Denmark during the 1970s, we had an oil crisis. Uh, the oil prices were, were very high, and the Danish government made a very bold decision. They decided to enlarge <coughs> energy taxes very much in order to force companies and consumers to save on energy, not just use it, you know. So ever since I was a child, I learned that you have to turn off the light when you leave the room, uh, you have to turn off the water when you're brushing your teeth and not let the water run. And the companies has been doing an extreme amount in order to become more energy efficient. And this means that we have a huge business community now that offers all of a variety of things regarding energy efficiency. And I'm hoping very much that, that the legislators here in Russia will do the same thing, trying to push for a greening of the economy. Uh, this will give us an opportunity to sell a lot of things for you. It will help. Uh, on fighting climate change, and it will help your economy uh, tremendously. So uh, I'm hoping very much that this is one of the areas where we can, uh, where we can have more, more cooperation. But I would say I also have the goal that investors from abroad have to start at least a thousand new jobs in Denmark each year. So Russia is more than welcome. <clears throat> Thank you very much again. Very impressive Danish. Uh, I was not expecting anyone to speak Danish here, and you have both <laughs> teachers and students speaking Danish. This is uh, fantastic. And I would say, yes, you're absolutely right. Our vision is that the Arctic Council 
should be the international organization for discussing Arctic matters. This is also the reason why Denmark has been very much in favor of solving the observer question, because we have been very much afraid that if the Arctic Council said no to including anyone else in our discussions, then some might think, then we want to get the UN to make a new body discussing Arctic uh, issues. And that would be very bad for us, because I think it should mainly be the, the peoples of the Arctic and the countries which, con which consist of the Arctic region where we should have the discussions about uh, our common future. So I'm very happy that in Nuuk we actually decided on a procedure now so that we will hopefully be able uh, to, during, Danish, uh, during Swedish presidency, welcome the first observers. I think that it's fair that both China, the European Union, uh, Korea, Japan, I think even Singapore wants to be part of the discussion. Of course, they will not have voting rights, but they will be able to sit and discuss with us the future of, uh, of the Arctic. Uh, so we will do our best in order to make sure the Arctic Council is the place to discuss Arctic matters. Uh, I think we should call it a day. So thank you very much. It was a real pleasure not only to see you here, but to talk to you. And I think it's a general impression of the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you for many interesting questions. We did not have that much time because we have to go now to a business lunch, but I just wanted to say to you that if any of you have more questions for me, you are most welcome to ask me those questions. Uh, you can both uh, find me on Facebook and also uh, find me, of course, on the ministry and on the Danish parliament the page. I have an email which is not read in the ministry. I only read it. So if you have more questions for me, please don't hesitate uh, to ask me a question. Preferably in English. My Russian is not that good. Uh, but in English, you're most welcome to ask me questions if there's anything else you want to know. Thank you very much.